So it seems a little bit um, confusing, but who had your own mayor? Rabbi Gamliel, the son of Yehuda, and us, he used to say, I say Ritzono Kuritzonecha, make his will, God's will, as if it were your will. So that your will be done according to his will. In other words, if God's will is your will, then your will will be God's will. In other words, if you do what God asks of you, the assumption is that God will do what you ask of him because you're asking it of God for the sake of for the sake of serving him. So if you if you live your life in such a way that you understand that you're trying to do what Hashem wants, so then one can reasonably hope and expect that, that Hashem will facilitate and give you from His side what you need in order to accomplish this. Now nullify your will before God's will. In other words, do what you know is right, not what you feel like doing. So other people's will should be, should be um, nullified before yours. Once again, uh, if you do what God wants, then those who come to harm you and to trouble you, um, their desire will be negated because you are living your life for the right, for the right purpose. Baba Trevor once observed that the idea is that, that one can even look at the simpler and deeper at the same time. Make his will as your will, it means to say that your ambition and will becomes what God wants. But on the other hand, you want your will to become his, which means to say that ultimately, since God created a physical world, everything we need physically is really necessary for us to be able to live in the physical world and do the mitzvot. So when a person is committed to Hashem's will, so as if it were your ordinary stuff, Ritzon Cha becomes Ritzon If one lives as one should, then your ordinary, in other words, when you desire to eat, or you desire sustenance, you desire support or security, whatever you desire, is literally your desire and what God desires because everything you do is for the sake of Hashem. Um, Hillel, Hillel says, and now we come to Hillel, we come all the way back to Hillel. So we finish sort of, at this point, we finish the chronological progress. We're no longer going through generation by generation. Because if you remember, the whole first chapter was generation by generation. And then the second chapter we began with Rabbi Yudha Anasi, who authored the mission. And then we have his son, um, who even though he's, uh, he's nominally after the period of the mission, he was already active when his father wrote the mission to John. But with this, we come to the end of the chronological discussion of the Avot, of the preceding generations to our day, because Rabbi Gamliel is extremely contemporaneous with the Mishnah. He is, a uh, matter of the fact, he is really after the Mishnah, except because his father was Rebbe and he was older. He finds his way into the Mishnah. But on the whole, this ends the chronological pro uh, progress because, <laughs> because uh, we're now up to what was then the end of the line. So now for the rest of Pirkei Avot, we're no longer going to go in chronological order. We're just going to quote things in a way that is conceptually interesting. So we go back to Hillel. We were a little bit about before, but we'll hear from many times in Pirkei Avot as befitting someone who was a, a deep thinker and concerned with ethical matters. So Hillel says, Al Tifrosh min Hatzibor. Do not separate from the community. Which means to say that even if you think uh, you're smarter and better, don't separate from the community. Um, you know, just because you think you're more holy, don't separate and go, go off and dive in on your own. Um, don't say, you know, this, these people are hopeless, I'm not going to deal with them at all. As the Rambam says, someone who keeps all the mitzvot but isn't engaged with the community is also a form of heretic. So don't separate yourself from the community. If the community is doing something, even if you think you could do it better, you have better ideas how it should be done, 
participate. In other words, there is a value to Jews doing things as a Jewish community, which is intrinsic rather than extrinsic. It's not what they're doing, it's the fact that they're doing it. So even if you can do it better, which we don't doubt that every Jew can obviously do it better, nevertheless, one should put one's uh, knowledge that you can do it better aside if they would only listen to you and just uh, participate in whatever the community is participating in. And the same thing is that if the community has a certain custom and you don't agree with it, just suck it up and, uh, and, and go along. Don't believe in yourself until the day that you die. It's really related. You know, the, the too much individuality is not a good thing. Don't separate from the community because you think you're better. And don't believe in yourself to the day you die. In other words, don't imagine that you're so good and so perfect that you can't mess up big time. As the Talmud and Brachot said, Yochanan, the high priest, served for 80 years. So he must have been over 100. Um, and at the end, in his very last years, he became a sadist. He you know, rejected the oral tradition. So don't believe in yourself until the day you die. It's always possible to mess up. Don't imagine you're perfect. That's why don't separate from the community because you're not necessarily better than them. And don't imagine you're perfect because you're not. Well, and therefore, if you're not going to if you're able not to trust yourself, don't judge your fellow until you get to his place. In other words, you think you're so much better, but you don't have that person's challenges, so don't judge the person until you're in their place. Do not say that I can tell someone something because it won't be heard, because the end is it will be heard. Mark Twain says two people can keep a secret if one of them is dead. So don't say things that will not be heard because the end is they will be heard. Do not say that when I have spare time I'll study Torah. Shem alotufana, maybe you'll never have spare time. You just have to seize the time to study Torah no matter what. Because if you wait for perfection. So basically, the, all of these things say don't, don't believe in yourself too much. Um, don't, uh, don't wait for perfection. Don't think you're perfect. That's really what it comes down to. Understand, and understand that someone else's flaws might not make them less perfect than you because you might be worse if you were in their position and so on. But this is the great theme of Hillel here, that, that as much as we want to believe in, in what you're capable of, don't ever for a moment imagine that you have it right and every, you know, you, you somehow have it right and you have it over everyone else. And don't imagine somehow that, uh, that you're special in such a way that, uh, that you can shortcut all the, uh, all the necessary, uh, shall we say, steps and checks and balances. Now this statement, don't something that won't be the simple deacons, don't be so sure of yourself, right? So if that's the theme, don't be sure that something you say won't be heard. Because things always get heard or leaked or whatever. So um, that being said, um, the Bartonur says something differently. He says, don't say something that can't be properly understood in the hope it will be understood later. Don't give a vague explanation in the hope the person will get it. Because in the end, you might give a vague explanation and the person will get it completely wrong and then they'll go through their lives and teach others the wrong way to do things. You know, which happens all the time. People hear half a story. So don't say something that can't properly be understood. Shasofo lishama, on the hope that at the end it'll be properly understood. Explain it right in the first place. You know, it's very nice to be humble and all that, but here's not a place to be humble. Don't assume that people know anything. Spell it out. So that's the Bartonurus, you know, the, 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 uh, that's, that's one of them. Now, um, another, uh, 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 so th those are the two most common answers. Um, Rashi, interestingly enough, says that this is related to the question of, of don't say when I'll have time, I'll study, because maybe you won't have time. Don't say I don't have time now to hear, because in the end I'll learn this. 
He sees the Rashi sees this as one statement. Don't say I don't I cannot understand this now, but I'll understand it later, because that's like saying when I have time to study, I'll study. At any rate, what all these things have in common um, is an understanding that our time is limited, that our understanding is limited, uh, that a lot of the limitations of the individual are canceled by doing things as a community, by doing things as a group, because we tend not to have exactly the same shortcomings, and that therefore we should trust ourselves best in the context of, of, uh, of a community. And that's, uh, that is the core theme here, which of course is a terribly, terribly important theme for the kind of thing we're talking about. Now, Hillel loved everyone, but who are you, Omer? He used to say, nevertheless, even though he loved everyone, even people who were, whose only good thing you could say about them is God created them, he said the fact is that Judaism demands knowledge. You cannot be a ignorant, observant Jew. You might be okay, you might be a good Jew in spite of your ignorance because you mean well and God forgives you. But you cannot be observant. You cannot, no one who is ignorant of Torah can be a Jew who observes it. You may have all kinds of reasons why God won't punish you for not observing it. But without knowledge, there is no observance of Judaism. In other words, the one's observance of Judaism is commensurate with their knowledge. Again, we're not saying don't judge the person to you in their place. That's why the, all, these, all these statements come first. You know, don't judge the person, you know, God will reward him for the good things he or she did and, you know, and not punish them for things they're not responsible for. But at the same time, you know, maybe God won't call you to account or me to account for not knowing, but God certainly will ask, why didn't you know? So Hill makes the point that, um, you know, that he's not a populist. He's not suggesting that knowledge, he's not a Philistine. He's not suggesting knowledge isn't necessary. Who are you? I mean, the same Hill used to say, Ein bor someone completely ignorant of Torah. A bor means, li, 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 a bor is, by the way, not with an O, boer, which means a pit. Bor means an unplowed field. You have brains, you've never used them. So, a person who is completely ignorant, or mostly ignorant, cannot fear sin. Because A, you don't know what is a sin, and B, you don't know what the implications of doing a sin are, because you can have alert. And an ignoramus, an amaretz is, not a, per, is a person who is ignorant, but not completely so. But he's not a, he, is, he is only able to read the chumash and to repeat what he's taught, but he can't study the Mishnah and understand what it's telling him on its own. So he, it's, a, it's a literate person. And Amaret says literate, a boar might not be literate at all, he may be, but a boar knows nothing. And Amaret is capable of studying scripture, is capable of understanding Torah, but is not capable of taking a, a text or idea of the oral tradition and learning it on his own. That this is the consensus, the many opinions as to what it is. So a chassid, a righteous person, is someone who goes beyond the letter of the law. So without, without basic skills, you can't possibly do what's right. And without more advanced skills, you can't develop... In other words, piety and knowledge are related in Judaism. To develop a subtle sense of chassidut, which means that the person goes beyond the letter of the law, you have to understand the letter of the law, you have to understand in which direction you should go, right? It's better to pray a little bit longer than the minion, not so good to pray a little bit less so. It's better to give more tzedakah than is mandated, absolutely, not less so. But it's better to indulge less in physical pleasures that are permitted than more so. So you have to have a good understanding uh, of sort of the philosophical implications of what you're doing. So to truly fear, to, to, be, to, to truly be a righteous person, a person has to have the ability for subtle knowledge of the Torah. <coughs> now, since learning is so essential, the shy person cannot learn. And shyness sometimes comes from arrogance. You don't want to show that you don't know something. If you don't ask, you won't learn. Below a captain malame. But the person who is very demanding, who is very strict, will never teach. 
Because if you're really tough and you're really harsh and you're really demanding, people aren't going to want to ask you questions. So the person who doesn't ask a question cannot learn. But the person who doesn't make people comfortable asking those questions, or the person who is judgmental about what he sees as a stupid question, is just as bad. Either way, the person doesn't learn. And most people, not most people who spend too much time on their businesses, don't necessarily become wise in Torah. So if you'll say, whoa, am I truly a scholar? It's so hard to be a proper, to know what, to know what one needs to know. So, but where there are no men, Ishtad Elotish tries to be a man. In other words, it's all good and fine to say that I don't really trust myself and I don't know a great deal. But if you have a situation where someone needs knowledge and someone needs to act, and you're the one who knows the most there, in the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king. So if, you, if you're the one who knows, go with what you know. In other words, knowledge never ends. So on one hand, without knowledge, you can't do anything. On the other hand, learning demands the ability to ask questions and the ability of the teacher not to, not to be harsh or judgmental in answering them. But all that being said, maybe if you feel your learning isn't done yet and you're not ready to deal with the issue, something comes up, you think you know the answer, no one else knows the answer, open your mouth and say it. So with these, with these principles, we understand everyone needs to learn. Uh, people need to, uh, need to understand the level of skill necessary. But at the end of the day, if you know Aleph and Bet, and someone only knows Aleph, you teach him Bet. And if you have some idea of what to do in a given case, and there's no one else there who knows better, well, go with what you know. Divine Providence put you there. Even though you shouldn't really trust yourself. Even though you might only be an Amaretz. You might not be a scholar yet. But where there are no men, go be a man. So these, all, these, all these things are, intrinsic, are intrinsically connected. Don't say things in vague ways. Don't claim that when you have time you'll properly study because you never will. And understand that, that, that there's no such thing in Judaism as the simple religious person. Without knowledge of Torah, you cannot possibly be religious or observant. To the extent you are, that's based on what knowledge you have. Is knowledge alone worth anything? No. But can you live as a Jew without knowledge? Also not. As the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe once said, the Baal Shem Tov once spoke about someone you know, who had this great reward in paradise because he said till him, even though he didn't understand it, wherever he went, and that's all he could do. He didn't understand it till him, he just said it. So the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe remarked that he has a great reward for you know, saying till him all, you know, all day long without knowing what it means but he'll be held to account for not having learned how to know what it means. You know, so there's, you know, there's, in other words, there, there are two statements in Chassidut which are really borne out by Hillel. One statement is that every Jew has great value and you can't judge anyone and everyone's mitzvahs is worse the same as anyone else's. But on the other hand, but on the other hand, you can't do any of those things without knowledge, properly. So, the, so this is basically an appeal for knowledge and understanding that in Judaism, knowledge is not optional, it's not for clergy, and it's not for specialized people. <laughs> to the extent that an ordinary Jew is going to be observant and religious, that's a function of their knowledge. But there's a way to go about that knowledge. Among them, that, that uh, you should put aside any sense that you know anything, because then if you think you know stuff, you won't ask questions. A. And B, don't make it difficult for people to ask those questions. Because if you, if in your pursuit of perfection, um, you, you, you discourage someone from asking questions, you've consigned that person to ignorance for their whole lives. 
So you have to be really, really careful in how you teach. Because if you teach wrong, you can ruin someone for life. Afu, the same Hillel, rogue, as you see, Hillel could be tough when he needed to. He saw Gugola Sachas, a certain skull, should suff up their mind floating on the water. Omelah, he told the skull, Gugola is female, even though it was probably the skull of a man. Al dat feichat because you drowned others, you were drowned. For sof, but feichat for those who drowned, you will also be drowned. So, um, so basically, he says, you know, he sees this skull floating. He says, you know, you got drowned because you drowned others. And at the end, those who drowned you will also be drowned because they didn't drown you because they thought they were doing some righteous act. They drowned you because they felt like drowning you. Now, the question is, how did Hillel know this besides, you know, uh, you know divine foreknowledge? So some say that he simply made the point that often this is what happens. That uh, you know that, that you seem to have been drowned. Very often, though not always in this world, there's sort of a, an accounting. Um, those who drowned you in the end be drowned because God. We've talked about this in the past. If you need a bump on your head, God might tempt me to hit you with a hammer, or God might might cause a wind to blow and a brick to fall off a. A workman's, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, scaffolding. Either way, you get the bump in the head. It's up to God. But if I, but if I punch you upside the head, well, then I've done something wrong. I've done a sin. I've chosen to do something wrong. So the point is, is that, um, is that, is that God may have organized that you get the that you get to you to happen to you what you did to others. But those people, we assume, had no positive intentions, didn't know what terrible person you were, and so on. So they were purely doing it for their own aggrandizement and their own benefit. And therefore, in the end, they'll be drowned. And obviously, it's not necessarily literally the case. Um, what I'm saying is, is that uh, not, not necessarily is Halo speaking specifically about drowning, but about this general idea. Now once again, Hillel is being is is is, uh, is being quite clear about the realities of life. He said, "Marba baser marbarim, more flesh, more works." In other words, uh, it's not the body that goes uh, that goes on to the next life. So all you're doing is so the the more flesh, which means to say, the more a person indulges in physical pleasure for its own sake, the more works. So you know, it's it's a it's something life goes by and then you have nothing for all your pursuit of pleasure. Marba nefas and marba daiga, the more property, the more worry. Doesn't mean God doesn't give some people a lot of property. But with greater property comes greater worry. The people who, who, um, who literally will never have to work another day in their life, nevertheless, get all stressed out over some business deal they're doing. Because it's the nature of property to make you want more. It's the nature of property to make you worry about it. And the, the point being that... That it's one thing if God gives you something, that's the burden you have to bear. Some people God tests with, with poverty, some people God tests with wealth. But the person who is pursuing the pleasures of the flesh is just providing more worm, you know, more worm, expensive worm food. The person who pursues property, you know, as the most important thing in their life is merely getting more things to worry about. If, as we said earlier, make his will like your will, if you pursue if you pursue, uh, if you pursue physical pleasure because of Shabbos, or you pursue uh, property because you want to give charity or send your kids to Jewish school, whatever. That's all cool. But if you pursue property for its own sake, you're just acquiring worry. And if you pursue money for its own sake, and you pursue pleasure for its own sake, you're just acquiring pleasure. Marben Oshim, you have too many wives. Marben Shafim, you have more sorcery. Because the women are, are all trying to, 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 uh, to secure the affections of the one man in the household, in which case it was common in those days to use sorcery. And the problem with sorcery is, A, it's stupid, 
according to the Rambam, and B, it's a form of idolatry. What, what's the point he's making? The point he's making is that why do people turn to witchcraft? It's because they feel, they feel helpless, they feel they can't control their world, so they seek some other <coughs> power to control. That's why people turn to all these, uh, you know, all these supernatural things. And by the way, the difference between God is that typically one doesn't turn to God and say, God, you know, uh, you know, uh, get rid of this person or help me undermine this person and so on. You don't say that to God with a straight face. The whole idea of witchcraft is the premise that you can manipulate spiritual powers and derive benefit from them without any, without any moral investment on your part. What's the idea of witchcraft? You have the spell, it works for you. It doesn't make a difference if you're virtuous or not virtuous, righteous or not righteous. With Hashem, we believe Hashem is all-powerful, but we can't say, God, you know, help me rob a bank. You know, we can't with a straight face say, you know, God, help me take this person's husband away from, you know, from, or wife away from their spouse, because I want to be with this person. But with witchcraft, that's okay. So that, that's the pernicious thing of witchcraft, the premise that spirituality can be amoral. So marbin nashim, marbik shavim. The person who has more than one wife is someone who is clearly, um, you know, who is, who is uh, clearly creating a household um, in which, uh, in which essentially um, the considerations of physical pleasure and, and status are above everything. So by divorcing his life from God, you create a situation of kshafim, you create a situation of witchcraft where people seek to run their lives and utilize spiritual forces because their lives are not in their own control instead of improving themselves but but rather by degrading themselves if you have many maidservants uh, you have much immorality uh, because they you know if you have lots of unattached women running around a household and Therefore, we assume a lot of unattached men. You're going to have problems. Again, um, the reason why someone have lots of servants and all that is to look good. But in the process, you create a household where exter. If you create a household of externalities, so you know, uh, so then you know, there's nothing more superficial than um, than 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 licentiousness. There's nothing more superficial than a relationship that is solely about the fleeting physical gratification that comes with it. So Hillel is actually making the point that each kind of problem, you devote yourself to property, you get worried because ultimately that's what property brings you um, unless you have the right intention. You try to create this really complicated household with lots of wives, well you're going to bring in you're going to bring in a uh, you know a very distorted view of the family and therefore of religion. You want to have this huge household where you're impressing everyone. Well, if you create a household of people who are superficial, <coughs> uh, you create a household of superficial relationships, a.k.a. licentiousness. Marba um, Vodim, if you have lots of manservants, Marba Ghazali, you have lots of theft. Um, the basic premise being, if you put people in charge of stuff um, and... Uh, and the results of what they do, their, you know, their employment, you know, in other words, their pay, which is their room and board they get anyway. So if you divorce work from performance, you get a lot of stealing. People just take what they can. As everyone who lived through the Soviet Union knows, since no one really got anything out of doing what they did, uh, you know, stealing stuff was extremely rife. Um, you know, like, like, uh, like, like Yuri's story with how he got the suspension parts for his car, right? So, uh, so uh, you know, so so marbava the marbagazel, you create a class of people who have no benefit from honest investment in the economy. And you're gonna have a lot of stealing. And in Russia, everyone was a servant of the Soviet Union. Everyone was a servant of the state. So you have a lot of stealing, you know, which is different from the kind of uh, of stealing you have here. But anyway, this is the point. That if you create a household in which some negative value is paramount, you will end up dealing with the physical negativity 
of the inherent spiritual problem that comes from this negative physical value. So negative physical value creates a negative spiritual atmosphere, which in turn creates other negative spirit physical outcomes. On the other hand, mar Torah, the more Torah, mar b'chayim, the more life. Because, uh, you know, we, Torah, you know, by studying, you don't take it away from someone else. So mar Torah, now, in other words, because uh, the Torah tells you to live for a purpose, so there's more life. A purposeful life always has advantages over a non-purposeful life. Mar yeshiva, mar uh, The more you sit together with others and study, that's what it means, yeshiva, to sit together with others, the more wisdom. Mar mar The more you seek counsel of others, um, the more understanding you are. Mar tzedakah, the more... Charity you give them more peace, um, and and uh, you know because basically um, you create a, a but you create a situation where <coughs> where as if it were uh, people are <coughs> people have every desire as if it were to cheer you up. So you notice that these um, that 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 you have uh, you have in the negatives you have one two. Three, four, five, and in the positives you have one, two, three, four, and we'll get to the fifth in a moment. So let's go through them and compare them. So mar Torah, mar b'chayim. The more Torah, the more life. The more flesh, the more death. The more the worms eat a person after they're dead, and maybe the quicker they get to their lunch. The more you devote yourself to physical things, the more dead you are. The more you devote yourself to Torah, the more alive you are, because all the physical pleasures you don't take with you into the next world, notwithstanding the Muslims. But the Torah you do take to the next world. So Torah gives you eternal life, devoting yourself to the physical guarantees that everything you enjoy ends at the doorstep to the grave. The more property, the more worry. And what's the counterpart? The more sitting together, um, the more wisdom. If you acquire property, you just end up with more things to worry about. If you acquire the, the, uh, the togetherness of studying Torah together, so that's the opposite. The less you have to worry. You acquire, you, you, yeshiva means you acquire a group of people who are genuinely devoted to each other because they're devoted to each other on the basis of truth. Marbe Eitza Marbe Tavuna, the more counsel you take, the more wisdom. That corresponds to Marbe Shvachot, the more maid servants, the more immorality, right? What we say a sota is a, the wayward woman is because uh, no one sins unless a spirit of folly enters their head. So, what's the opposite of that? Is the more a person takes wise counsel, the more you, the, the more you, uh, uh, you know, the less frivolous you are, the less, the more serious you are, um, the more you include others, the more understanding. And as we know, as it says in Mishlei, the immoral person lacks heart. The wise person understands. The wise person only engages in relationships that are rewarding and have a purpose. So licentiousness, which is the superficial connection between people, is the opposite of a connection which comes from deep understanding, that comes in turn from seeking counsel. And the last is the more servants, the more theft, um, because essentially you have all these people who you benefit from having them around, but they don't benefit, so you guarantee theft. So there it says, Kana Shem Tov, if you acquire a good name, you've acquired the good name for yourself. Kanalo de Torah, you've acquired words of Torah. Kanalo Chayamala, you've acquired life in the world to come. Now, the first thing, by the way, and good name is a good thing. A good name, uh, a, having a lot of servants is an attempt to make yourself important by virtue of your wealth, the size of your establishment, and so on. And since you're not thinking about the servants, you end up with a lot of theft. Having a good name, you acquire a good name by thinking about other people. Servants you use. You use people, you lose stuff. You, you, you use it, people you lose. If you 
if you um, if you interact with other people to their benefit, if you care about them, that's how you get a good name. A good name is someone is someone who cares about others. Definition of a good name. When you mention the name, people smile. People say, "I like this person." Why do you like someone? Not why do you admire them. That's something else. Why do you like someone? Because they're there for you. So acquiring a good name is the opposite of acquiring people solely for you to show off. You don't care about them. But if you acquire a good name, it benefits you, which means to say in the end, the, if you acquire servants, you end up with your stuff getting stolen. You acquire a good name, it benefits you. You have people who care about you too. But that being said, if you acquire Torah, which there is no direct counterpart to this, you acquire life from the word to come. Because uh, the admiration of others, however laudable it is, for even the good reasons, you can't bring that with you. I mean, mitzvot you bring with you to some extent. But knowledge of Torah, that's, that's eternal. So at any rate, this whole Mishnah d- demonstrates sort of the counterpart between a life in which, in, 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 in which uh, other people are and other and your world is subordinate to your instant gratification and the opposite is where your world is subordinate to the desire for a larger and greater purpose that transcends life. And a lot of people don't often notice that the mission is actually pretty precisely structured in this, this regard. Okay, we've covered a lot of ideas, so I'd like to pause for questions, comments. <coughs> By the way, for those who are wondering, um, the, in his Code of Jewish Law, um, the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, quantifies a boar as someone who cannot translate a verse of Kumash on their own. And an Amma Eretz is someone who cannot, uh, who cannot study a page of Talmud on their own. Though one, one might argue that the availability of translations makes both of those uh, bars easier to reach. It doesn't say you can't use help, it just means you have to be able to do these things. Not to be a bore, you have to be able to access the basis text of Judaism. Not to be an Amaretz, you have to be able to understand the whys and the hows behind them at some level. That's really cool. And both are crucial, and both are important, and both are not optional. That, that's really the key point. Anyway, it's your comment. You noted that um, there was a warning against judgment. Right. Um, yet, yet, uh, uh, it, it, intuitively, it's clear that that judging based on you know on, on, on the law. Is you judge actions, not people. Right, but 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 uh, but then you said that you have to put yourself in his shoes in order to. Uh, That's to judge the person's um, guilt, not the not the. In other words, I see someone doing something wrong. I should be able to say right away that's wrong. I don't believe in moral relativism. Torah doesn't believe in moral relativism. I should be able to say that's a wrong thing. How responsible the person is, and how much worthy they are of punishment, and how much we should be critical of them for not for not doing the thing. That's a separate issue. We should be able to objectively analyze every action. Whether we assign responsibility and guilt and criticism to that wrong action because of the person's linkage to it, that's a separate question.
I don't say that because people don't keep Shabbat, Shabbat is no longer important. Or it should be downgraded its level of importance. No, Shabbat is terribly important. I understand that there are a lot of people who neither studied it thoroughly nor grew up with it, in which if you didn't grow up with Shabbat, as you know, it takes a lot of effort to, uh, to implement it. And therefore, I don't assign guilt to the person who doesn't do it. That doesn't mean that I recommend changing the law. I, I was thinking about a different situation. Um, Go ahead. Uh, uh, well, back in Russia, there's a uh, uh, lot of, well, uh, there were some norms or some principles within this uh, circle where we live. What we can do, what we cannot do. Um, uh, uh, for example, you know, uh, to, to, to become a party member was kind of a bad, uh, it was considered a bad, bad behavior. Right? Yet many people did this. Uh, so the question is, could, could, could we judge them? Or? You can judge actions. Right, but no, no, the, 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 the action reflects a person. It's not, it's not, it's not right, so the question, so, so, so don't judge a fellow until you go in their shoes. What pressures are there? Are they perhaps told that this job now needs you to be a party member to have the job? Right, um, right. Were they, were they, were they, were they told that they had committed some, some uh, imagined infraction with the only atonement as they join the party? Um, no, but this was the point, that, that some people wouldn't go there even though they wouldn't Right, but the question is, what, what's, the, you know, what's the degree of, you know, how vulnerable are you? you know, what's the, in other words, you know, how strong are you? you know, part of the issue is some people are not very strong. They can't handle being beaten up very well. Other people are better at it. You know, the, the point being that, that don't judge your fellow to you in their place means that even though we know it's a wrong act and a guilty act, don't judge them because it might have been much harder for them to do what's right than it's for you to do what's right. Right, but, the, but then if you continue developing this logic, you, can, you, you cannot judge almost anything. Right, you know, that's the point. In any case, you can say... Okay, that's the point. We, we, we indeed do not, and only God knows how guilty a person is. I punish, in, in the law, you punish people and make <laughs> them liable because of the perceived, because of how the action looks to us. We can't do any better than that. That's why repentance doesn't work. You know, if someone has a jailhouse conversion on death row, we still execute them. You know, we, we have no knowledge of what's really going on inside a person's head. So the law is the law, and we follow the law. But we might execute someone who arguably, we might say, isn't really as terrible as someone else out there. Judging a person is about judging the value of the person, not the question of what the appropriate penalties are and so on. It's entirely, they're two entirely separate questions. And the reason we're saying this is, is because if you think someone is terrible and unredeemable, you're not going to work with them. You're not going to teach them. In other words, how far gone is this person? And the more you judge the person, the more you're going, the less you're going to devote yourself to changing it. But secondly, it's absolutely true that every person is different and every person's struggles are intensely private. And we don't know the extent of the struggle. What for you is no big deal. It might be a huge titanic struggle for someone else. That's what Hill is trying to sensitize you. I also have a question for you, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a stupid question, but it bothers me. Why? Lo ha bai shalami. Exactly. Shai person doesn't learn. It's no based stupid on, question. Based on this yeah, principle. Um, uh, I'm wondering why the beauty of all this philosophy and beauty of all this ethic uh, remains completely unappreciated by the rest of the mankind. And Greek ideas came through. Uh, Questionable Roman ideas went through. Then well, I think, I think to, be, to be fair, it's not so simple because 
you know, clearly some of the better Roman ideas are influenced by these ideas. And clearly, clearly a lot of the positive things, there are positive things that came through Christianity and Islam have their roots here. Remember, Perkei Avot represents ideas that have been well developed two, three hundred years before the Mishnah. Everything in the New Testament that isn't nonsense has its roots in the same original text that produced the Kirk Yavon. So I, I can't help but thinking that all this modesty and uh, uh, preservation, which is, you know, we learned about... Is yeah, but Jews were never modest about, about content, only about, the, only, about the, um, only about the transmitter of the content. Exactly, the lack of advertisement. I think it played some role in it. Yeah, but I'm saying is Jews were always willing to advertise the value of the Torah. They tended to, you know, in other, in other, in other, in, in other words, uh, in, in other words, uh, the Jews understood um, that the best way to the best way to distribute content is to let it be platform independent. You know, the so Torah is the original HTML, right? Works in any platform. Apparently, it's not <laughs> the best way if you judge by result. Well, it's complicated because we always understood. I mean, that that's part of the challenge of the Jewish people. That even when people listen to you. They pretend they didn't listen to you. I mean, the fact is, again, see, uh, you have to take the look at the big picture. In the big picture, a lot of these ideas got out there. But it's also true that Jews could do a much better idea of getting these ideas now that, out there now that there are, is no criminal sanction for Jews teaching their ideas to other people. You know, I mean, this is something, you know, it, tonight uh, represents the day uh, that the Lubavitcher Rebbe came to this country. And one of the things he constantly made the point was that Judaism doesn't change, but circumstances do. And a lot of the things, the cultural things we do as Jews, such as not publicly celebrating Jewish holidays, you know, you know, being reticent about public displays of Judaism, and being unwilling to share the universal ideas of Judaism, which are many, you know, with the whole world, and, 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 and when there are serious moral issues, you know, to weigh in on them. <coughs> in all these cases, the Rebbe said, this is all leftover stuff from the era where Jews expressing their opinion about matters outside the Jewish community put the Jewish community in danger. And those days are over, but, you know, 50, 60 years on, we're still stuck in that mindset. Well, that's exactly the point. So, well, the, so what I'm saying is, is that is that the is that the the phase of Galut that ends sort of with the fall of communism, that particular phase of exile, right, um, has had a a a long lasting trauma on Jews that they even when they become free, they have this unwillingness. I mean, someone was asking the night, what's this phenomenon of self hating Jews? You know why? You know, why is, you know, why is always the loudest and strongest voices against Israel, Jewish voices, and so on, in countries that allow Jews to exist there? And there is this sense, <coughs> there is somehow this sense among Jews that they're in danger unless they're seen as, uh, as not rocking the boat. And <coughs> one of the points the Lubavitcher ever made time and time again from when he came to this country, that now we can rock the boat and we ought to rock the boat. But what you describe is the problem of Galut, and it's a problem that is, that is over from the outside and still exists in the inside, and the only solution is really to go ahead and do these things, which is what a lot of us try to do. But in Galut, why... But by the way, I want to say, I was, we, were, we did a program, it was for the lawyers in Montreal, a medical malpractice. We have this really wonderful physician speak, and he's talking about attitudes in medicine, training, and so on. And, you know, and he made the point that, you know, that, that, that certain fundamental ethical and human considerations are very much missing, right? And it struck me at, at that moment um, that, that every one of these considerations he listed is found in Pirkei Avot and other places. It's clear to me that, in other words, we don't have immediate problems of survival in Western society. The problems have to do with the structure of society, with the cohesion of society, with the survival of society. And on all those issues, whether it be the need to have children and the need to have stable families, or, 
or how doctors should see their patients, or what the function of the law should be. All those things are questions that Judea. All the problems we have today, even the questions, you know, once we get to the bottom of, you know, or whatever, you know, assuming that there are significant environmental issues and so on, which seems to be the consensus. Um, the, the question of what you give up and who needs to give up and so on are all questions Jewish ethics deals with. In other words, my point is that most of the practical questions we face today in advanced societies have significant treatments to them, significant solutions to them in Jewish tradition. I mean, this is what you know, this is what I mostly do. Half the people there yesterday were in Jewish. I mean, this is what I mostly do. So the answers exist for all these for two thousand years, but it's still completely unaware. The difference is that because we live in a more open world which is created by the permutation of Jewish ideas, we're now finally in a position where we can get listened to. So are, you, are you saying that uh, I'm saying books we need to should be more. published uh, left and right in English without... I'm saying that the, Pirkeyav, that the ideas of the Pirkei Avot, as they relate to modern questions, as they have the benefit of 2,000 years of commentary, that much more needs to be done to get the ideas out in a way that's approachable. Answering your question, Professor, I suspect that if if you were just sort of pull out the the ethical rules and norms and advices coming from here by itself, it would not impress you uh, too much. Uh, and what we feel about this book now is that we we sense that it was a written two thousand years ago. And be on top of it. No, but I, I think two thousand years of proof that it works. Yeah, but Sergey, but a lot of the a lot of the ideas here are actually um, relatively subtle, subtle, not always intuitive, um, and and frankly, demand some stuff. You know, and and more importantly, you have two thousand years of commentary. It's not just it was said a long time ago. There's an incredibly sophisticated system. Remember, you know, um, the, the question of, of right and wrong in many arenas, that's the essence of halacha, including in the fuzzy, you know, interhuman ethical areas. That's the nature of halacha, defining the right and the wrong, defining the moral and immoral, and so on. And in a sense, Pirkei carries that on in, in a more inner sphere. And just the opposite. I think a lot of those ideas are really entirely relevant and not really well known. I still think that we as a nation did something wrong in uh, not spreading the word and then putting ourselves in a false situation of being no, tainted by the rest of people. See that, but see, that's not true. Until the, until the, the revolution in Judea, Jews were very active in spreading the word. That's, nobody you know, listened. What? Nobody listened. A lot of people listen. Actually, <laughs> You actually even had a lot of converts to Judaism, not just people who adopt. First of all, two things. One is one of the reasons Christianity spread so quickly is because a lot of non-Jews had been taught about the Noahide laws and such ideas, because Jews were pretty aggressive about it. But second of all, like you know, most Moroccan Jews are descended from Berbers, you know, from the mountain tribes that Jews converted. Uh, what ton of converts in the Roman Empire? What Christianity did was it took those ideas and made them accessible to people and, you know, and essentially, you know, promised them, you know, <coughs> paradise without having to do all the stuff that Judaism demands. But it's very clear from everything we know from that period that Jews were very aggressive about getting their ideas across. You know, most of, most of Philo's right, Philo Judaeus's writings weren't made so much for his fellow Jews as they were with an eye to none. Yeah, Professor, I have a question. Uh, it says because you drowned others, you were drowned, and so on. It implies big fairness in life. Well, we know that life is not fair. Well, I, th th that's a very good question. It's one that everyone asks, one that Hill is aware of. And, and the point being is, well, the point Hill is making is that every once in a while it's really obvious. 
The point Hillel is making that every once in a while you get this obvious justice. In other words, on the whole, you might not be able to point to life being fair, but often enough you can see a very obvious justice if you want. That was Hillel's point. It doesn't say that, he, that there's always fairness. He, he says that he once saw a skull. And he says, ah, this is what's happening here. If you continue it into next life and next life, does fairness uh, become universal then? If you count life at the life that isn't in a body, yeah, I mean, that's really the point, that, that the, this physical life isn't really enough to handle all the things we need to be fair about. Um, reward, punishment, and so on and so forth. You know, but that being said, That being said, every once in a while, you know, the justice is so blatantly obvious, and that's what Hillel is pointing to. He says, you know, sometimes we get a glimpse of, uh, you know, of how things ought to work. You know, every time, you know, every time a potential suicide, every time a bomb maker blows himself up, you know, that's, you know, because you drown, you know, it's obvious. There are times, you know, where, where, where it's obvious. But the, you know, and, and that's why Hillel is pointing it out. Hillel is actually telling us something very important related to your question. Hillel is telling us that even though on the whole you can't point to a fairness in this life, it happens more often than you think, if you have eyes and are willing to see. Yes, there isn't always fairness in this life. On the other hand, Afu, we also saw this. In other words, if you look, you'll see it more than you think. And that's the counterpoint, that the fact that life isn't always fair doesn't mean that it isn't sometimes fair. And there is a value to those sometimes. We have covered a nice amount of ground. I wish everyone a really wonderful show. Thank you very much. Um, we are not meeting Sunday. We are not meeting Sunday because I'll still be on a plane, but we are meeting next Thursday, God willing. And hopefully the Sunday after that, all things being equal, we'll have that breakfast and I'll tell you about drinking and other such adventures. Take care, thank you all so much for coming. What do we hear from your son?
Христос ще хотів вара прикарати. І ми її зробили. Давай тут Rabbi, I asked an interesting question last time, which was, you know, what do you pray for somebody who doesn't believe in God? Yeah. Shouldn't we just pray for tshuva? Like, we pray for ourselves for tshuva, correct? Tshuva. Yeah. 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 We, 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 can't we... Can't you can pray for someone with tshuva, but you should yeah. pray for them anyway, because, but, but, but you should care about them anyway. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm saying is, the same way you care about yourself that you should be healed, it's not true as a need to, it's always healing, so you know what I mean? Oh, I see. So basically, in other words, you have to care about them like you care about yourself even before they, they get it right. So making their shuva a bar to pray for them is a... Oh, no, no, I meant... You, you asked me, why you pray for somebody who does not believe in God, right? That's the right question. So if you pray for, like we pray for ourselves for Shuba, correct? Right. So if we pray for them, for well, them Shuba, then that's fine. You love them in their life and they're, they're like, well, that's not better in any case. That's no? true, but that's true too. But my point is that's the true. fact that they don't believe in God doesn't mean that God doesn't control their lives and therefore prayer is appropriate. Because they don't, you know, it's, they might not believe in God, but God is still engaged in their life. That's the point. In other words, God doesn't dis if you disengage from someone's life just because they don't believe in them. No, of course, but if they, they may, you know, if, if they believe in them, they might do As I can tell you, the failure to take gravity into account is changing that gravity. Or, okay, but then they might, they might say that once they do believe, no. and then their life will, will become... That's 